the kids are dismissed to Children's Church, and if we can have the ushers come forward. All right, if you will bow your heads with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for letting us gather into your presence this morning. We ask that you bless the offering as we bring it into your storehouses. Um, use it to further your kingdom. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The fall festival was a huge hit. I mean, I even had lots of fun. <laughs> it was very enjoyable, and it was great to see the kids running around. So um, we definitely need to do that again. Uh, so um, uh, my prayer, um, just to 
go with Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in his name, there I am with you. So bow with me in prayer. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the blessings of fellowship. As we all gather here with friends, family, and others to worship and learn about you. May your Holy Spirit guide our interactions. Let every song, song sung, every word spoken, and every prayer lifted be pleasing to you. Father, grant that our time together here today will be used to build each other up and draw each other closer to you. May our pastor's word lift us up, our worship be genuine, our learning deep, and our fellowship sweet. We lift all the prayers request on our bulletin today, those that are on there and those that are unspoken. May your will be done in each and every one of these requests. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning again, church. It is wonderful to be with you all this morning. You know, like, like Cindy said, yesterday was just such a, a blessing. Uh, when my dad came down this week, I didn't realize that it was going to be the week of the fall festival until just a little while ago. And so I was so excited for that. He's like, man, you guys do events like this every week? I was like, nah, not every week. I wish we did. It'd be, it'd be overwhelming if we did. Uh, especially for people that plan those types of things. But it was a, a wonderful success. And so I thank you all again for, for that. And I, again, I pray we continue to have things like that. Uh, next time, hopefully, Hurricane Milton or any other kind of hurricane won't hit us. And uh, we'll be able to get that out sooner so more people will come for an outreach portion of it. But I know the church itself really, really did love that. And so as I begin this morning, I want to read a, a few verses that I've been focusing on in Bible study over the last couple weeks. It's honestly a few verses that have been at the forefront of my thinking and my prayer life since Hurricane Milton made its way through here a couple weeks ago. Uh, these verses, they, they've given me strength and they've helped me to lean on him during these very hard times for so many. And the best part is, y'all know I don't believe in, in accidents or coincidences. I use that phrase a lot. I say that all the time. And the fact that we have been in these uh, verses in Bible study on Wednesday, and as slow as I move, and Katie can attest to this, as slow as I move in, in Romans, because we have so many people talking and so much back and forth, we were still in these verses as all of this happened. Because if had I sped up or moved forward, we wouldn't have been in these verses. And it was exactly what I've needed, and I pray it's what you've needed too. Uh, but it gave me all I needed to know that God had all of us right where he needed for us to be able to listen to him. And so for those of you that are here Wednesday, you remember this, I told you to remember because you would hear it again, but it's in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, and it says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord." These have been at the forefront of my thinking, and, and as I was thinking about today, and I thought about Paul, I know he, he writes these messages to the church in Rome, and as we read it, we realize that God truly is with us, no matter what. No matter where we are in life or what is going on, nothing can separate us from the one who has given his all for us, which leads me to our next few passages of scripture. I tell you each week, what I'm about to preach on is going to be heavy. It's probably going to hit you hard. I'm kind of giving you a precursor to that this morning. Today's not going to be any different. It's probably going to hit you pretty hard. You're going to take it home with you, and that's okay, because that's what I want to happen. And so we're going to go straight into Psalm chapter 139, verses 1 through 6. It says this, <clears throat> You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. King David, known as a a man after God's own heart, right? A man who loved God, but he still struggled at times with sin. Would you agree with that? And I'm not here this morning to gauge sin. I wouldn't do that. A sin is a sin. Had that conversation with my wife a long time ago. Before I was Christian, we just started going to church together. I think I've told you this. This is one of those wrestling matches that I had. I went to church and they tried to tell me a sin is a sin. And I tried to sit there, well, no, murder and stealing a candy bar, those aren't the same thing. And luckily, I have a wonderful wife who was able to sit there and grew up in the church who helped me along with other pastors realize, no, a sin is a sin. It's, it's a matter of heart. And when you realize that and understand that, it, it helps you to truly understand the word of God. But we're not going to go that route today. And I'm not here to gauge David's sin. But when he sinned, he sinned big time, right? Am I right in that when we look at David? He knew he could be forgiven of his sin. When he went to God and he asked wholeheartedly, can I be forgiven? He knew he could be forgiven because he could take his broken heart before God, ask for forgiveness, and it would be given, right? But honestly, and it kind of breaks my heart this morning, but I think there is a big difference between David and some of our modern Christians today, right? When we see when it comes to being broken and asking for forgiveness. And what do I mean by that? Well, you see, David was literally sick to his stomach over what he did. He was ill physically, mentally, and spiritually when he turned his back on the Lord. Today, I think most people think they can mumble a phrase or utter a small unenthused prayer so God will forgive them and they can go on their merry way. I've had this conversation with people But this was never the way that true repentance was supposed to work. It was never the way true repentance was supposed to be. You see, when we sin, we fall short of the glory of God. And for those of us, all of us, right, we still slip. We still stumble daily. We are not perfect. But when we go to the Lord and we ask for forgiveness and we repent, we should genuinely mean it. It shouldn't just be some, well, I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway. I know it's wrong, and I'll just ask God because he's so forgiving, and he will forgive me for it, right? It should make us, like David, sick to our stomachs when we slip and we fall. It should eat at us. It should gnaw at our insides until we're forced to go to a prayer room or our bedside and repent and plead with God to take it away from us it's important to understand that you see when I know I slip and I stumble I have got to go to the Lord and make it right not only that I've got to go to the person and make it right you can ask my wife there's times where I've said something or I've done something you know husbands and wives you kind of do that and you nudge and you joke sometimes you take that a little too far wife gets a little angry or upset with you're like I just meant it as a joke I'm so sorry We all know what I'm talking about. Don't laugh, don't look at your spouse, but you know what I'm talking about. And there's times where I'm like, okay, in this moment, I need to go and ask my wife for forgiveness. I'm going to go and do that. My wife and I, we've been together 15 years now, okay? So she knows if I'm being genuine or if I'm just trying to say it to make the room and the mood better. We better mean it when we go to our wife. We better mean it when we go to the Lord and we say that we're sorry. When we ask for forgiveness, it's important. You can't just go and say these things and do it to, you know, stutter through the emotions and do these types of things because it's not real and it's not genuine, right? Coming to God as Christians and saying that, we believe in him, doesn't give us some get out of hell free card. I want you to understand that. You know, I talk about it all the time. Even the demons believe. I know a lot of people, and I've had conversations with many of you in Bible study who have friends, who have family, that say, well, my so-and-so family member or my so-and-so friend, they believe in God. 
well, that's good. Do they have an active relationship with God or do they just believe there's a God? Because there's a lot of people who can look around at the trees and the oceans and the mountains and say, well, I believe there's a God. I don't think, you know, some spontaneous combustion just happened and here we are. I believe in a God. Well, that's, that's fine and dandy, but we weren't put here to just believe there is a God. We were put here to have an active, living, breathing relationship with the God of the universe who created everything. Would you agree with that? Amen. That's important for us to realize as I go forward in this sermon, so I'm glad I got a lot of amens out of that. Unfortunately, there's so many people today who have been told this lie. That if they just ask God to forgive them, and mind you, God is a forgiving God. We serve a very gracious and forgiving God. But they can just utter it and not mean it and say, hey, forgive me for this, but I'm going to run out and do the same thing tomorrow. And that request will be granted, right? If there is no real sorrow in their voices, if there is no real sorrow in their spirit, when they lift that request up before the Lord, then it means absolutely nothing. I want you to understand that this morning. If you slip and you stumble, that's okay. I'm not here to beat you up for that. We're all going to do that. But if you slip and you stumble and you go to the Lord for forgiveness, you better mean it. You better mean it. And that goes for any person that you've trespassed against as well. You better mean it. You see, David, he realizes that God is always present with him, no matter where he is or what he is doing. I have to have that conversation with a lot of friends of mine, right, that still look at things they shouldn't look at, watch things they shouldn't watch, say things they shouldn't say, listen to things they shouldn't do. They feel like when they go into that room and under that roof, God just has no ability to see through the first and second floor of the house. It doesn't work that way, friends. I'm sorry. God can see it. And, and even, you want me to dig a little deeper than that? If you're thinking it, God knows you're thinking it. If, you, if you're thinking about saying it, well, maybe he already knows you're thinking about it. And that's why we have to lean into the Holy Spirit. That's why we have to understand who our God is. So those thoughts and those actions beforehand, we can have them, you know, change. That we don't think those things and act in that certain way. And that's very, very important, church. The same goes for you and I, right? The same goes for you and I. If we give this half-hearted request of forgiveness, knowing good and well we're going to go right back out into the world and commit that same sin, God already knows. He already knows. He's already shaking his head, and he knows if we're being genuine or not. In this passage, David knows God is with him. God is not only with David, but God is also protecting him. The same way he watches over and protects each and every one of us each and every day. God holds us in his hands the same way he did David. God knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He created you. He made you just the way you are. And here David says that God has searched him and knows him completely. Makes me wonder if Paul was thinking about the next part of this as he wrote these words to the church in Rome. Psalm chapter 139 verses 7 through 12 says this, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. Brothers and sisters, we have to realize, like David, that, again, nothing can separate us from God. You can try to go into that room, try to go into that store, try to go into that movie theater, try to go into wherever. You're not going to escape God seeing all of those things. When David was in the middle of his darkest moment, even when his son Absalom was trying to kill him to steal the throne for himself, God still protected him, right? God still protected him. And I don't know if you've ever read the book Tortured for Christ. If you haven't, it's a very, very good book. But it was written by Reverend Richard Wormbrand, who had been a pastor in Eastern Europe when communism had took over. And Reverend Wormbrand refused to renounce Christ 
as his savior. And because of that, he was thrown into prison. No, we're getting ready to come up on election here, and I'm not going to talk politically, but aren't you glad you don't live in a country right now that because you speak out on your faith in Christ, you're imprisoned? Could happen. May happen someday. But it's happening in other places in the world, and it has taken place over centuries. But he was thrown into prison because he would not renounce his faith in Christ. Not only was he put into prison, but he was beaten And he was tortured regularly, and yet he never relinquished his faith. I'd love to sit around here and look at all hundred of you or so and sit here and say, man, we preach so good each week. We're so tight-knit at Spirit Lake. Arrest all of them. Put them all to the spear. Go ahead and threaten death. And every single one of them would say, we're not renouncing our faith. Would I be 100% right in saying that? I've never had that conversation or seen you put in that situation, so I don't know. But I would like to say that's where we would be. I would love to tell you as a father and a husband, that's how I would be. But I pray each and every day that I'm moving closer to that, that I would be, no matter what, I would never relinquish my faith. Because as Christians, that's what we're called to do. I don't care what's happening out there. I don't care who's president. I don't care about the political spectrum. We should be able to vote based off of what we feel morally and things like that. But no matter how bad it gets, Jesus is still king. He still sits on the throne. Doesn't matter about that stuff. You should have your thoughts morally. You should go into that booth and vote for who you want. But at the end of the day, he is still king. So no matter how bad it gets, no matter what happens, you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, would I be willing to die for him? Would I be willing to sit there and sing his praises and spout off scriptures that I remember from memorization? I've been challenging you all to do that, right? Would you be able to do those things no matter what is taking place? And for a lot of us, we really need to question that today as we leave because that's where we're trying to get to. That's where we should be. No matter what takes place, we should never be willing to renounce our faith in Christ. That is what's called unrelenting Faith, that is taking your relationship with Jesus Christ to another level. It's what the disciples of Jesus did in his day, and my friends, it's what you're called to do as well. Amen? Amen. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 says this. A lot of you know this. We use this in a lot of spectrums. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me written in your book before one of them came to be. I tell you all the time, when you come, many of you have come to me personally, we've talked in my office, and you ask about the Lord, well, did the Lord know this? The Lord knew you, he thought of you, he knew when you would be born, way before you even took a breath on this earth. He knew you, he planned for you. So if you're sitting there this morning, you're going, man, I've, I've messed up this week, I messed up last month, messed up last year, my whole life has been a train wreck, I'm nothing but a mess that's okay. Today is a new day. Today starts new. He knew when he created you. He knew those things were going to happen, but you have the option to change it now. You have the option to change it now. It took a message much like this for me some 10, 12 years ago to for me to hear and say, you know what? I don't have to be stuck in this lifestyle anymore. I don't have to live like this anymore. Because I can live for him. I can give my life to him. I can let the Holy Spirit take up residence and I can be something new. And that's what all of us need to remember. Maybe you needed that reminder this this week. I know in the last couple weeks, doesn't matter whether I'm pastor, doesn't matter whether I stand up here and speak each Sunday, I needed that reminder. It's easy when things collapse around you to get in your own head and throw a self-pity party. It's easy to do that. What's harder to do is to get up and say, you know what? Everything happens. The Lord has already seen all this. He knew this was going to happen. I'm going to take the next step, and I'm going to live for him. That's all that we have to do. It's not easy. I know. Pity parties are, I don't want to call them fun, but they're easy to do. But what we need to do 
is let him guide us. Let him be the great shepherd that he is. Let him help us to take that next step when we're not able to. David knew that he could not even take a breath without the truly wonderful work of God. Informing us and and giving us lungs to breathe. You understand that, right? I did a funeral this week for a wonderful man. It was an untimely death. It wasn't something I wanted to do. It wasn't something that I know his friends didn't want to see. But I do know where he is now. I do know that he's rejoicing in heaven now. Now we could sit here and and be upset about it. Or we could live for what he wants us to live for. And that's proclaiming the gospel. It's talking about Jesus. I know that's what he would have wanted. He saw something different in this church. Saw something different in all of you. It's important for us to remember and take that next step. God gave us the ability for, for our body, for the, who we are, to, to work automatically, right? For those of us that are healthy, some people, my mom right now, you know, we talked about it needs oxygen and things like that. But when you take a breath into your lungs, you know you don't need to sit there and think about, okay, breathe one, breathe two. No, you automatically do that. That's in your body. That's who you are. God designed you to do that, right? We would be unable to remember to breathe consistently as we're supposed to if we had to do all the mechanical realities it took to simply inhale oxygen not talking about seeing hearing listening to a conversation all that's fun and of itself i'm just talking about breathing i have to admit something church knowing god intimately like this it's something not a lot of people have figured out there's a lot of people who attend church in this country regularly But there's a lot of people that do that that don't intimately know who God is. Most people, they cannot comprehend it, right? But for those of us who have, there's nothing in the world that can compare to it. Sometimes we need a simple reminder. The world takes over, right? Things happen. We get caught up. But sometimes we need a reminder of what it's like to intimately know God like that and realize that that's the most important thing in our life. Our relationship with the Lord It is not for sale. It's not to be bargained with. There is no gift worth trading because to those of us who truly know him, he is absolutely everything to us. He is our breath. He is the reason for waking up in the morning. I wouldn't have my wife and my children without him, so I'd have no reason. If I was looking outside of the box, outside of God, I could say, people, oh, your reason for life is your wife and your children. Well, without the Lord, I wouldn't have them because I knew what I was before him. The reason we wake up in the morning is to serve him, to live for him. There's so many people in each one of your lives right now that do not genuinely and intimately know him now let's talk about some of those people for a moment this one might be one of my longer sermons i hope you're okay with that there are those who say that it's not god but just chance that we have become what we are today i have some atheist friends some agnostic friends who say listen give yourself some credit You were able to beat some of those demons in your life, and you did that all on your own. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. There is no way, because the sinful, flesh-driven Anthony wants to still do those things. I would still be doing those things if it wasn't for the Lord. So you have people that say, it's just by chance, right? That truthfully, that we are nothing. You all have friends that say this. We are nothing but a a bunch of molecules that just happen to form just the right way. And somehow we ended up these men and women with these lives that we have, right? And in their opinion, we're at the top of this evolutionary food chain, totem pole, so to speak. And who knows where we'll be in a, a few thousand years as a race, right? We might evolve into some super race because we're continuing. I'm just talking some conversations I've had with friends. I hope you'll keep up. Because we're continually evolving, of course, that means that God must not really exist, right? Because everything began with a a big bang, and over millions of years, we evolved to become these intelligent human beings, and of course, began to take over the earth from the animals, and now we're where we are. Who knows where we'll be? Again, just some of the conversations I've had. This argument's been going on for a while, right? Right? And my question always ends up being, if you do not believe in God, many of you have had this with your friends, then what do you believe in, right? 
Well, evolutionists believe when we die that, that that's it, right? That's it. There's nothing after death, and we just go back to the ground, and some have said become fertilizer, become food for insects and things like that, maybe a bit more, but just want to tell you what they think. But for me, in my relationship with the Lord, and the truth that I know, which is the only truth that there actually is, as a Christian and one who believes in God, I love the thought that the one who created me, who wonderfully crafted the body in which I live, loves me and wants a relationship with me. And for those of us that have that intimate relationship with the Lord that I talked about, you know that truth to be real. You've, you've had that discussion and felt the Spirit inside of you say this to you, that this is the only truth that there is, right? And I know for a fact, when I die, it really is just the doorway into the amazing presence of Jesus, my Savior. That for me is so reassuring no matter how bad the storms of life tend to get. And the simple reality is that we are all made in the image of God, right? And the fact of the matter is that we have eternity staring us square in the face. This week I've heard friends and people tell me, well, I've got to get my affairs in order. I've got to do this or I've got to do that, right? We are wonderfully crafted together in our mother's womb before we're even born. God knows us because he created us. God knows whether we will come to him and and, and accept him as Savior, whether we'll come to Jesus because he is there at our birth and through our entire lives working to bring us into the kingdom of God. You know my favorite part about preaching in a room like this is? You have such a vast array of ages. You have a lot of children in the back, some one, some two, some all the way up Over here, I've got the youth. I've got people in school. Man, talk about the stuff they're going through right now. Things they're talking about with with girls, the things they're talking about with friends, the things that they have to deal with. I know what it was like just some few years ago when I did. I can't imagine some of the things that y'all have to wrestle with right now. You've got that. Then you go up into your 20s and your 30s, and I'm not going to put an age on anybody, so we'll just go up to 110. I don't think anyone's that old in this room. So you've got all the way up to that age. You've got a different spectrum of people in here that have lived different parts of their lives, come to God at different times, and gone through all this gamut of emotions. And the amazing thing is we can sit in here and listen and feel the presence of God and understand that he does love us. Now, some of us are more versed in scripture than others, and that's okay. But I think in this room, if I'm being honest, you have a group of people with at least the desire to learn, to know more, to hear about this God. But I want every one of you, especially you you young ones over there, the youth, because I remember being your age and being at a church and hearing a pastor say those things and be like, he don't know me, he don't know my life, I don't got to listen to him. I remember saying that. The next couple years, you all have a choice to make. You have a choice to to live for Christ. You have a choice to to listen, to to read the word of God, to pray, to, to lead your families in that. Or you have a choice to follow the world. I turn on the news each and every day, and I watch what takes place, and I see how bad it's gotten even since I was your age. My advice to you and my love for every single one of you, read the word of God. Cling to him, pray to him, talk to him, take up a relationship with him. Because if it's gotten this bad in the last 20 years since I was your age, I can't imagine what the next 20 is going to hold. You need to cling to him. You need to gravitate towards him and surround yourself with brothers and sisters. You might look around this room, people have called me old. My kids call me old, that's okay, I am old. You might look around this room and see people that are older than you. I call them more wise, more mature than you are. But when you look around and you see that, you know what those people are good for? Advice. Mentoring. Every one of us, you're like, man, they couldn't possibly know what I'm going through. Yes, we do. We've been through it. We've been beating up this world. has chewed us up, spit us out, just thrown us to the wolves. I promise you. And we're still here fighting, and it's only by the grace of God that we're doing that. So please, if there's questions you have about the world, about school, about anything, come talk to us. These people in here, they want to do that. They might be shy. They might be introverted and not come up to you. But if you go to them, they're going to talk to you. They're going to give you advice. And they're going to point you 
to have a better relationship with him. If this is you sitting on this side, sorry to isolate the youth over there. If that's you sitting on this side, though, maybe it's you. I don't care if you're 40, 50, 70, 90, 110, whatever it is. Maybe you're sitting there, this is for me. I want to know the Lord better. I've been just kind of coasting and cruising. I thought I knew who he was, but I don't really feel I do. I don't have that intimate relationship that you're talking about. Good, this message was for you. That God worked the way he wanted to. Come talk to me. When I got into doing this, when I got into doing this, the Lord pointed me to do this because one day he wanted me to stand up there in heaven and look around and say, when you listen to that calling, when you listen to what I had on your life, this person, this person, this person, they're all here today because you let me speak through you. I didn't want any of the glory. I don't want any of the honor in that. What I want is for you all to understand how good he is. I want you all to have that same experience that I had when I finally surrendered my life to him. And I fought it. Boy, did I fight it. I did. I didn't want to do it. I like living in sin. I wanted to continue doing what I was doing. I told you all, I wanted to at 80, 90, 100 years old. Lord, I lived a good life. Forgive me for what I did. I'm ready to come home. Don't let that be you. You're not always promised tomorrow. I've seen too many people in my eight years of doing this think tomorrow's coming that never get to tomorrow. Man, I had a whole bunch of stuff written that I was going to write. Then God just kind of said, go this way. So I did. Somebody in here needed to hear that message this morning. And I needed to give that message this morning. When I think about who God is, and I think about the love that he's, he's shown me in my life, I get emotional because I don't deserve the love that I've had. I could tell you life is easy. I could tell you once I became a Christian, everything became perfect, but it didn't. But I do know that he's been with me every step of the way. Even when I get mad, even when I get upset, even when I think I know best, I don't. But he's never given up on me yet. He's not ready to give up on you yet either. Here in a few moments, we're going to take communion. And I want to do that with you. But I, I, it's more than anything, I haven't done one in a while. At the end of the service, when Sarah and the worship team come up, we're going to do an altar call today. For you youth that I just spoke to, I didn't write any of that today. Normally, I'm pretty good about outlines and things like that. That just, that just came out. For those of you sitting in the congregation today, I don't know what it is that you're going through, what you're wrestling with right now, but doing this life with you all, battling in the trenches with you the way that I do, I know there's a lot of you going through a lot of things. A hurricane didn't help any of us, but even before that, a lot of you are going through a lot of things. Your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Luckily, a lot of you have opened up to me and given me the ability to know what some of those are so I can pray for you, so I can be there for you. I want you to understand, no matter how bleak things look right now, in the end, he wins. He wears the victor's crown. And I know <laughs> the closer I get to him and the harder I see things in this world, the more I know he is the only truth that I need in this life. So I pray this week when the altars are opened, I've seen it before, one, two people come up. This is the week I want to see the altar flooded. I want to see a lot of you up here. I don't want you to worry about what your neighbor's doing. I don't want you to worry about what somebody else is thinking about you. I'll turn the camera off. You don't want people to see you come up here. That's fine. But I want you to come forward and I want you to genuinely begin that relationship with the Lord today. Well, pastor, you've been challenging us to read scripture, and I said I'm going to get to it tomorrow. Maybe I'll get to it. No, let's start today. Well, pastor, I really don't know how to pray or how to talk. I don't know how to even begin. Let's start that today. There is no time like the present to grow that relationship with the Lord. Psalm chapter 139, verses 23 and 24 says this. I skipped way ahead, Becky, I'm just letting you know. I jumped all the way to 23 and 24. I went completely off of what I had, and that's okay. It says this, search me, God, 
and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I jumped ahead like six verses. Didn't even plan it, came right to this verse, and that's exactly where I want it to be. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Lead me into a relationship with you. Help usher me into eternity with you forever. Brothers and sisters, it's time to take communion together. I want to pause and take this moment to come to this table together. And I want each of us this morning to take a few moments and think about how your walk with the Lord has been over the last several weeks, the last several months, the last several years, or maybe there's some of you who have never had a walk with the Lord. That's okay. Today is new, like I said. Are you trying to get to know him on a personal level, or are you just coming to church on Sunday? Are you wanting your relationship with him to thrive, or are you just wanting weekend visits with him? I didn't always have custody of my oldest son, Anthony. I used to have what you would call weekend visits. Do you know how hard that was for me before I had custody of him? Every single day, it was like the breath was being pulled out of my body because I couldn't see my son until I finally had custody of him. And then I got to see him each waking day, and I got to see him turn into the young man he is who's going to lead me in two weeks and go start a married life of his own, which I'm very happy and proud of you for, but also going to break down like a baby in a couple weeks. I know that. When I think about the Lord, and I think about our relationship with him, or for many of us, lack thereof, that's what Jesus sees when he sees us. Well, I only get to see them one hour a week on Sunday mornings. This is hard for me. Boy, I sure do love them. I wish they loved me the way that I love them. Maybe one day they'll want more than an hour a week with me. This message, for those of you that think like that, is for you this morning. Take that one hour a week and turn it into something permanent. Every part of your life can resonate Christ. Every part of who you are can be Him coming out of you. You being the hands and feet. Might not happen overnight, but your love for Him, that desire to know Him like that, it can happen overnight. For me, September 4th, 2012 changed everything. That is when it happened for me. That is when my heart completely changed forever. Has it been a road of this up and down and up and down? Boy, has it ever. But that's okay, because in each of those moments, I've been taught something. In each of those moments, I've been able to give more of myself to him. And I pray today that this message spoke to you, and you are going to be able to give more of yourself to him. I want to see each of you have a relationship with him that is on fire, that is growing, that does not stop until you go home. Amen? Amen? All right, for those of you who have never done communion here at the church, very, very easy. My wife is going to come up here and help me pass these out. For those of you who can't stand up, I know that some of you, just put your hands, there he is, he, ooh, man, change seats on me, it's because we're reorganizing. Tony will come around and pass those out to you, just kindly put your hand up. Uh, everybody from the middle all the way over to this side, you're going to come up to me and get the elements. Everybody from this side over, you're going to come up the middle this side and get the elements from Heather. Do not partake in the bread or the juice until we all have it, and we're going to read some scripture, and we'll do it together.
Does everybody have the elements who, who wanted the elements this morning? Okay. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24 says this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, his body was broken on our behalf. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. <clears throat> In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Remember, today is new. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My friends, this is the blood poured out for us all. Well, church, <clears throat> as we close this morning, I want to say this. The scriptures that we just read, the way that the Lord <laughs> moved in the message today. I had more that I was going to say, but that direction the Lord went is exactly what we're needed to go. But these scriptures tell us today that every single one of us, every single one of us in here this morning, has fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. David aware that he is human, aware that he's not perfect, that his life had been full of sin, asked that God had forgive him. If that's you this morning, if you've done something, lived a life full of sin, done these things, even if it's in the last week, day, month, whatever it is, this morning when the altar is open, as they play this last song, come forward. Make today count. Make today new in your life. Let me pray with you. Let a brother or sister come over here and pray with you. We as Christians, we should be doing this daily, right? Those of us who know the Lord, we should be in our hearts coming to the Lord each day in repentance, asking Him to forgive us. I don't want many of you who have been saved for a long time to think that this altar is some one-time event. It's not. I've talked to people that say, well, I went to the altar when I was 12 and I gave my life to Christ. That's great. I bet you've sinned since you were 12. Just being honest. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus or anything like that. But this altar is here for you. When you come up here, you're making all things new. You're asking the Lord to forgive you of all those things you knew you did. And even when you're on I-4 and you get angry and you don't know you did. I promise you, you can come up here and make those things new this morning. This lesson today was something we all needed to hear. None of us are perfect, right? There's things in this life, people I've talked to, churchgoers that do things that they do not think are sinful, but yet those things are moving them away from God's path. Let us come before the throne of grace this morning, that our hearts might be cleansed, that our lives might be renewed, that our path before us made clear. Today, is a new day. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we go to the last song this morning, I pray, Lord, I plead with you that this altar fill up. Not just one, not just two, Lord, but many of us come forward and we just ask you to forgive us. Forgive, forgive us of those trespasses that we've made. Forgive us of those things we didn't even know we were doing, Lord, but more importantly, that we be made new that we come to you, <clears throat> that you steer our paths in the direction they need to be made, Lord. 
Lord, so often we want to captain the ship. We want to be the one steering. Even when we come to you, Lord, we want to say we know what's best when we don't. This morning, Lord, let us come to you humbly and say, I no longer want to do this, but I give it all to you, the one who made me, the one who created me, the one who loves me daily. I want you to be the one to steer this ship. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As a reminder, the altar is open. If you will stand with us as we close in song this morning.
Well, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> maybe some of you didn't come forward. I've seen a lot of you come forward. That was awesome. But maybe some of you didn't this morning. Don't let that stop you. If here in a moment as we conclude the service and the songs stop and everybody starts filing out, you say, you know what, the Lord's just laying it on me to pray. There's something on my heart. There's something in my family. There's something in my marriage. There's something with my kids or my grandkids. Don't walk out of here today without starting anew. There's no time like the present. And doing some of the things that I've done over the last few months and seeing some of the things that I've seen, again, you are never promised tomorrow. It's a harsh reality sometimes, but for those of us who believe, we know what comes next. But if we don't have that relationship that I talked about this morning with our Lord, do we really know what happens next? Do we understand what that means? So as you leave this morning, think about that. I challenge each of you, you know I do this each week, I challenge each of you this week to search deep within yourself. Ask yourself how your relationship with the Lord is going. Am I only having that one hour on Sundays a week with him? Because I can promise you, he's on, you are on his mind way more than one hour a week. When I understood how much he loved us, when I understood what that cross truly meant, and why he did what he did for me specifically. Again, a lot of, oh, he did it for the whole world. Yes, he did. But you specifically were on his mind when he hung there. You specifically. Don't leave today without understanding how much he loves you and beginning that relationship with him. And if you've already begun it and you've staggered a bit, don't leave today without renewing that relationship with him this morning. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. I thank you for every single person here. I thank you for those watching online, Lord. Again, sometimes we just need a wake-up call. Sometimes we just need a reminder, Lord. This world is, is so full of chaos and craziness, Lord. We can, at times, just coast by. Well, I believe in God. I go to church. I have some Christian friends. I wear a cross. I even have a tattoo. You can have those types of things, but you can also be missing the most important thing of all, and that is a genuine relationship with you. So, Lord, don't let anybody hear it. It, it. Lord, in this moment as I'm praying and I feel your spirit, I pray whoever's feeling, well, that's me, that's who he's talking. Don't let them leave here this morning without praying with me, without talking with me, without them having a conversation about what it truly means to know you, Lord. Lord, I know you know and these people know how much I love them, Lord, and I don't want to sit idly by as we just coast week in and week out that's not what Spirit Lake Community Church is going to be about. It's going to be about loving you, Lord. It's going to be about loving people, and it's going to be about our relationship constantly growing as we come to know you better. Lord, thank you for this week. It's not oftentimes I just say thank you for scrapping an entire sermon while I'm in the middle of a sermon, but thank you for that, Lord, because that's what you did this week. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.